thank you for being here. And I hope we can make some, you know, good use of this time. Um, whew, wow. So yeah, um, I just, I'm not gonna take up a lot of your time because again, kind of like what I was saying, the best part of a conference is when you just kind of talk to each other, right? And build community with each other and make connections and network. And so I'm gonna do just a, a short little lunchtime performance and then people can keep eating. You can go, well, I mean, you can keep eating while I'm talking too, obviously, but, and then like, you know, go talk to each other, check out the, the art, check out um, Ricardo's stuff at, in the table, all of that before the workshop session starts. Um, so yeah. I will also warn you right off the bat that uh, you know my background is, is in education, and I, I hate to just stand up here and talk for 20 minutes. Um, I, I love you know dialogue and all that, but we only have a very short amount of time, and like y'all are gonna hopefully be talking all day to each other and building in that way. Um, but even so, in a general sense, like this is not a TED talk. You know, I don't have, I'm not a professor. Or I have a presentation. I think the beautiful thing about about being an artist is that like we don't have to have all the answers. We're not expected to have any answers. We can just ask questions and like share ideas and, and perspectives and I guess you know that kind of leads into a very brief little framing note I want to share before I jump into just a handful of poems which is <sighs> I started creating art um, both as a poet as, and as an MC at the exact same time I started being involved in organizing spaces and in, in movement building spaces and I'm really interested in how those two impulses intertwine um, and specifically I'm really interested in demystifying the idea of art that like Yes, art can be this like magical, beautiful expression of your soul and that it can be therapeutic and it can allow us to engage with ideas in a more like personal, visceral, emotional way. But that, that isn't all that art does. Because I think a lot of times, you know, when we treat art as kind of like flavor sprinkles on the larger feast of the movement or whatever metaphor you want to use, I think we do a disservice to both, which was one reason it was really incredible to see um, Ricardo Levens Morales as the keynote today. Like, I really appreciated that, that work. Um, but basically, so I'm going to share some poems, and my hope is that we can see not just, like, the emotional part of the poem, but also the critical stuff going on underneath the poem in terms of intentionality around audience, around um, my own identities and how I then relate to particular audiences, how that question of, like, what is the work of a particular poem um, is relevant to not just poetry, right? It's if people who are organizers, if you do media work, if you just have conversations with people, these are all things that I think hopefully lie underneath some of these poems. Because um, it's not just about how we can be honest or how we can be right, but it's how we can build a movement, right? So I, I will shut up and do a couple of poems. Um, I'm, my name is Kyle, by the way. <laughs> my, my stage name is Guante. I didn't really introduce myself. Um, but yeah. <sighs> okay, I'll just do it. A pocket full of props, a quick pound and a handshake, a free mixtape, a highway through a landscape as far from the Bronx as heaven is. A moment of uncertainty, a moment of clarity, and a moment of hesitance. A bio with a spark of truth, a couple sharpies, party music, and the Carter two. Lab cap in California, Illmatic and headshots, a couple handbills left in the back of a rest stop. A rhyme book, a sticker with my name on it, sticking through the rain, washing all the other flies down. Hoodie up, fitted to the side by the water, last minute to the side. Set list, rep this, living for the rhyme, but more so for what that rhyme represents. 45 minutes of our lives to connect. Broken hearts over break. Beats live and direct from the belly of the beast, striving to get free, and it won't all be that fast. This is called um, the invisible backpacker of privilege, or confessions of a white rapper. Um, one, KRS One says there are nine elements of hip hop, right? A solar system of art and fashion and innovation orbiting an inferno, and some promoters might book me over a black MC because they don't want to attract the wrong element. Two, it's easier for me to get a buzz going because most bloggers and videographers and music journalists and college radio DJs and booking agents in this town are white. And me, like, I don't necessarily even identify as like 100% Caucasian. Like, I'm mixed, right? But, but look at me. That usually doesn't fit on the flyer. Three, listeners who do often identify as white um, might actively seek out meaning in my music and relate to me because of it, um, rather than just you know looking for a good beat to dance to. And I will readily admit that I am very, very talented. <laughs> but is that talent the reason you bought my CD? 
Is that talent the reason you came to my show? Is that talent the reason I got this interview? I will never know. For I can code switch on a dime. We developed warp technology years ago and we'll leave this solar system as soon as we find a more fashionable one. Five, my music can be perceived as rebellious because it's hip hop, but safe because of my skin. Fans and listeners get to engage with an oppositional culture without ever leaving their racialized comfort zones, right? Tarzan is the king of the jungle. Tom Cruise is the last samurai. Michael J. Fox goes back in time and invents rock and roll in 1955. Six, the thing about stealing is that it is addictive. A little here, a, a little more, and, and we all know that it's not wrong to steal to feed your starving family and white kids in America are hungry. Whose food are they eating? Whose food are you eating? Whose food am I, am I eating? Seven. So, maybe white people don't really belong in hip hop. But white people don't really belong in America, if you think about it. So we're left with more questions than answers. We're left with questions, these questions, like what is the difference between acknowledging your privilege and acting on that acknowledgement? How do we define progress? How do we move forward? Who is we? Who should be we? Who deserves to belong in the category we? Eight, when I say one small step for man, you say one giant leap for mankind. Just remember whose planet you're standing on. Nine, the code of the quote unquote white rapper, if there ever was one, is this. Know the history, build community, put people on. And if they ever make you a monument, scratch your name out, break it, spit on it, burn it. We are not tourists, but we are also not the native inhabitants of this land. Aliens, invaders, put your hands up. Put your hands up. So yeah, just, I'm not going to talk too much, but very briefly in terms of function, like I'm thinking about, yes, on one level that's a poem about, about like whiteness and hip hop, but I think not everyone in here identifies with hip hop, right? Not everyone in here wants to talk about whiteness, but I think there's something else going on in, in that poem about, one, on an artistic level, how important it is to turn the lens inward, to not stand up on stage and be like, hey, all you racist people out there, stop being racist because it's bad, like, but to say like, how are we implicated, right? How are we part of, of these systems? And then finally, Something about, about action and, and allyship and redefine, really redefining what allyship means in terms of, okay, these are, these, this is where we're at, so what are we going to do? Like, what happens next? And that's going to be kind of a running theme through a couple of these pieces. Um, I just wrote a book. It's my first book ever. If anyone wants one, you can steal one. Um, and, again, the, the book process was really interesting because it's like, I'm not just talking to, like, attendees at an anti-racism conference. I'm talking to people I have access to in my work, which is generally high schoolers, which is college students, which is young people who may or may not already be in a movement space. And so I'm thinking about the work that art can do to have certain conversations that we don't always just get to have regularly. Um, so I'll, I'll share this piece as kind of an example of that process. And it's called How to Explain White Supremacy to a White Supremacist. Sometimes you are a lit match dropped into a boiling ocean. Sometimes you are a stray dog proud of the sunrise after a long night of barking at the moon. Sometimes you scream at the television, shadow box mushroom clouds, your hand-to-hand -hand hatred outclassed, outdated you, post-apocalyptic litter bug you, whose anger is so vast and so empty. All teeth and no mouth, no jaw muscles, just that white rattle. Remember. White supremacy is not a shark, right? It's the ocean. It's the water. It's how we talk about racism as white hoods and Confederate flags, knowing that you own those things and we don't. It's if we didn't own this history too, the, the, the system, we tread water and you, chum, in a bucket. How many skinheads do you think are in the room when they set immigration law or decide curriculum for public schools or push policies like redlining, mandatory minimum sentencing, benign neglect, gentrification, broken windows policing, voter ID, stop and frisk, three strikes, the drug war. Remember, the eye of the hurricane is the least destructive part. You, meanest glare in the chat room, all poker face and no cards. Was it your politically incorrect YouTube comment 
that made the median net worth of black families in this country 9% the median net worth of white families? Which individual Donald Trump bigot boogeyman are we supposed to be angry at about the millions of people impacted by discrimination in housing and banking and education and employment and the criminal justice system each year? Remember, sharks kill about one person each year. Thousands drown. So when there is a new name hashtag each week, when police create more black stars than Hollywood, how long do we keep pointing out the bad apples, ignoring the fact that the orchard itself was planted on a mass grave and that we planted it there? Because of course, this isn't really a poem for, for white supremacists. I don't know any white supremacists, but I know a lot of people in this room. I know a lot of people on my block. I know myself and I know how white supremacy is upheld. Whether through our action, our inaction, or just through paying our tuition and taxes, how it isn't just the broken treaty, it is also the treaty. How a gavel can speak as loudly as a grenade, how a white frat boy in blackface on Halloween and his friend who knows it's wrong but doesn't say anything begins to blur together how the real racists today are so often not even racist, right? Those teeth sharper when smiling, sharper still when smiling and meaning it. A burning cross is so dramatic. Just say, I don't see race. Just say, we all have an equal chance if we just work hard. Just say, all lives matter. Just say nothing. Surround yourself with others who say nothing and convince yourself then that silence is the only song, this muted underwater melody, this pulsing quiet. And when a chorus blooms in Baltimore, when trumpets sound in Ferguson, in Minneapolis, when every one of our cities breaks, into song. Will we hear it? Will we choose to listen? Or will we just continue treading water, watching for that great white shark, not realizing that we're drowning? So I'll just do a couple more, and then hopefully we can just hang out. Um, most of my work is actually, I get brought to, to colleges and high schools to talk about gender stuff. I talk a lot about like masculinity and feminism and et cetera, et cetera. And so I'm really, really interested in how, if I get brought out somewhere to do five poems about you know, ending gendered violence, how we can also have a conversation about race and racism, how we can also have a conversation about sexuality and class and ability and all these different things. So I think that's really important in this space too. When like those last two poems are very much about like, you know, whiteness and, and white supremacy, but we're talking about systems, right? We're talking about how important it is to have a systems lens for doing this work. How we have to acknowledge the personal and the institutional, right? How it's both, it isn't one or the other. And I think that that relates to so many other axes of identity, right? And axes of oppression. And so in that, in that, in that same kind of note, um, I'm gonna share another poem that I don't have memorized. <laughs> Which is a good lesson, if any of y'all are interested in spoken word, you don't have to memorize all your poems, like it's okay. Um, <laughs> And this is, I mentioned a little bit before about I think art is super liberating because we don't have to have all the answers. We have space to just ask questions about stuff and like struggle with, with stuff and, and be vulnerable in our own uncertainty about stuff. And that's really what, where this poem is coming from. This isn't an answer poem, it's a question poem, right? So. <clears throat> upon stumbling by chance, upon a man waist deep in quicksand, I, I need a second to process, right? I mean, it's like quicksand? That's not real, this is fiction made flesh. It's like going to the zoo and seeing a mermaid. So my first response, naturally, is to tell him, um, hey, I'm pretty sure that I read on the internet somewhere that quicksand isn't actually dangerous, that this idea of a patch of sandy water that sucks a person down into oblivion is just a tall tale, right? A trope to build tensions in early 1960s westerns. In real life, yeah. Maybe you could maybe find some quicksand and get caught in it, but it's not very common, not very hard to get out. So are you sure you're sinking in quicksand? He sinks. Uh, my words don't seem to have any effect. So being an open-minded, progressive individual, I, I re-evaluate. Maybe quicksand is real, so, so, so what now? My second response upon stumbling by chance upon a man chest deep in quicksand is, before I actually do anything, to you know, make sure I have the whole picture. Like, what was this guy doing out here in the jungle all alone? Did he step into that quicksand on purpose? Was he kind of asking for it? Does he have a criminal record? 
Maybe I should wait until all the facts come in. He sinks. And again, being an open-minded, progressive individual, I decided to give him the benefit of the doubt. I, I want to help, at least for now, I want to help. So my third response upon stumbling by chance upon a man neck deep in quicksand is, obviously, to recite a poem, right? To throw some spirit energy his way, to describe out loud just how heavy my heart is. I take a piece of paper out of my backpack. With a pen, I write, quicksand is bad, and I am an ally to those who fall in it. I pin that piece of paper to my chest. I take out my phone, and I tweet, when are we going to wake up? Hashtag quicksand. He sinks. And being an open-minded, progressive individual, I decide that this isn't enough, right? That we, as a society, need to address the root causes of people sinking in quicksand. So my fourth response upon stumbling by chance upon a man forehead deep in quicksand is to take a moment to, like, acknowledge and, and think about my privilege as someone who is not sinking in quicksand. I vow to, to you know, take a class or, or to challenge my friends when they make quicksand related jokes to be more mindful of how I navigate the world, he sinks. And being an open minded, progressive individual, I, I decide that the time for words has passed. Now is the time for action. So, my fifth response upon stumbling by chance upon a man disappeared into. Dis disappeared into quicksand is. We can't allow ourselves to, to forget what happened here. I, I, I know that we need to do something to, to put up a sign, to educate people, to build a bridge over this patch of quicksand. I just don't have any wood. I just have this backpack full of paper and pens and rope. What can one person even do? I imagine my lungs filling with mud, black earth, brown water, the hike back to my hotel will be full of reflection. I say a prayer under my breath. It is the least I can do. <sighs> so that, that's actually just about my time. I'm going to do like one more quick thing, um, and then y'all can hang out and then go to the next workshop. But with that piece, again, it's about my own uncertainty, about not just how important it is to like do good work in the world, but how that's like, that, that's the first step, right? Like that's not the last step. It's about thinking critically about what space do we have access to? What, what you know, what, what difference can we make? And yeah, I, I wrote the poem um, around, you know, the, the, the early couple of months of the Black Lives Matter movement, but how much does that relate to things like rape culture? How much does that relate to things like, like the Dakota Access Pipeline? How much does that relate to all these different issues that are being, being brought up? in terms of not just what can we do, but on a larger level, like how can we work together to do more? Um, and I don't have an answer for that. It's just something that I think is worth thinking about and thinking critically about, um, particularly in a space like this, where like we're all cool, everyone in this, well, mostly. Everyone in this space is like trying to do something good, right? So how do we, how do we leverage that? How do we do something with that? So I'm gonna end on a, a more hopeful note. I don't have a ton of like super hopeful pieces, but um, yeah. And let me just say real quick, too, before I'm done, uh, quick plugs. Like, yeah, I have a book. If anyone wants to check that out, please do. I have a square reader and all that. Um, it comes with a free CD. I also, um, the last album that I put out was a collaboration with, with a producer named Katra K, and it's, it's called Post Post Race. It's all hip-hop songs and spoken word poems from multiple voices talking about everything that's happened in the last couple of years, right? Um, Gianthi Kyle's on it, uh, Tish Jones, Jake Verdon, a bunch of cool people. So that's here as well. Um, and then finally, I'm also promoting, uh, I work with this organization called True Art Speaks. We do um, the Be Heard Minnesota Youth Poetry Slam every January, February, March. If you know young people, if any of y'all are young people who do spoken word, it's an incredible opportunity. We're on a free all ages open mic every Thursday night in Rondo, Golden Time Cafe. It's the best open mic in town. Um, plus in school programs, feel free to get in touch about that stuff too. Our next big show is actually Friday, the, the Friday right before election day at the University of Minnesota. It's free in all ages, there's a flyer for that too. Um, but yeah, so I'll finish with this, which I wrote after my grandmother passed away, and my grandmother was, was such a, a funnel for so much wisdom and, and like connection to, to my culture and stuff, and like I needed to remind myself in some sense that like the things that, that we fight against in terms of you know institutionalized capitalist white supremacy, right? Like these are big, scary things, and it can be super intimidating, it can be easy to, to be 
um, dismayed and, and discouraged in this work. And so I wanted to write a poem that was a reminder to myself that our resistance to these systems and these injustices is also really big and is also deeply connected going back dozens, hundreds, thousands of years, right? Um, and how taking part in that sort of struggle, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that, but there's also a lot of strength that can be drawn from that. And so, yeah. <clears throat> this is the art of drawing breath, of making visible what has been invisible. This is a pragmatist guide to faith. This is singing when you don't know how to pray. Welcome to this space. Know that you are not welcome here. We are all trespassers. We are not welcome here. This universe would like nothing more than for you to not exist. And the proof is in the history you live. Tell me this. What are the odds that this planet would appear in just the right place with the right atmosphere and geology? What are the odds that life would suddenly spark in the darkness from the carcass of this planet to a colony? What are the odds that this anomaly would spread? What are the odds it would survive and stay ahead of volcanic eruptions, meteorites, and earthquakes? That first drum, first beat, first rhythm, first break, first time the notes broke to form a system. You could hear the first melody, the first multi-celled organism. What are the odds this first environment to harbor life would meet another, maybe fight or maybe harmonize, but either way it would evolve. So what are the odds it would evolve to walk and not crawl, to fly but not fall, to survive every single mass extinction? What are the odds of your existence, right? How many generations did it take to make you? How many plagues, wars, and massacres conspired to uproot your family tree and salt the earth around it? How many ancestors carried your fire? How many farmers made it through the famine? How many runaway slaves got away? How many soldiers conscripted deserted? How many times did that chain almost break? How'd your grandparents meet? What was the song playing when you were conceived? Is it inconceivable, the happenstance inherent in this life you have inherited? See, some see the elegant complexity of bodies or the natural beauty of the planet, and they say it's godly. There's got to be divine intelligence behind it all because the odds that you would make it on your own are so small. And maybe, but me, I see millennia trying to murder you. I see a thousand generations of pain and fear. I see struggle inscribed into your skeleton and I see you still here. Ancestor armor star-crossed survivor, an unwelcome guest in a hostile environment. Defiance is your birthright. Fire from the first time you drew breath, a smile on your face. Welcome to this space. Know that you are not welcome here. We all trespassers, we are not welcome here. So if our drawing breath is blasphemy, sin, or treason, let's keep drawing breath until there's nothing left to breathe in. We are the codes that our ancestors still speak in. So, thank you for, for taking your lunch to listen to me. I hope people have some good conversations. Anyone wants to talk about, especially teachers, educators, you want to talk about any of that stuff, please come check out the stuff up here. And then y'all got like 15, 20 minutes before the, the first workshop starts. So, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>